welcome our next speaker, Cassidy James, as he talks about the title Curve Cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Let's see if this works. So I'm here to talk about curb cuts, um, accessibility features, or just features. My name is Cassidy James. I'm Cassidy James Blady. I'm involved uh, as co-founder and CXO at Elementary Inc. And in case you don't know what we make, we make Elementary OS. It's a Linux-based OS. I think you all probably know about it, so I'm going to skip it for time. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a platform, and that's from our stack. It's a lot of uh, overlap with GNOME technologies, but we're actually a distinct platform from GNOME and uh, collaborate upstream with them quite a bit. I want to preface this by saying I'm not an expert in accessibility by any means. Um, I've been working with elementary for about a decade now, but not I'm not formally trained in accessibility. Um, if a, an accessibility researcher or somebody who's been in the industry for a long time tells you something different than me, probably listen to them instead of me. Um, but I do want to talk about how we can change our mindset a little bit in software, and especially free and open source software, when it comes to accessibility and how we implement these features in our, in our products. So who knows what a curve cut is? And I think if you read the abstract of the talk, I maybe spoiled it there. But raise of hands, anybody know what a curve cut is or is familiar with that term? Oh, cool. So I can explain something. Um, it's where a sidewalk meets a road. It's simple. You've seen it probably in every major city pretty much around the world at this point for the last 60 years or so. Um, it was originally designed for wheelchairs. So curb cuts were an accessibility feature that, you know, before 60 years ago, these weren't a thing. You had a sidewalk and met a road, there was a curb, and you just jumped off the curb or jumped up the curb or whatever, and it was fine. Except for when there were wheelchairs involved and you'd have to have somebody literally lift you up and put you down on the sidewalk, and that's not a good experience. That's, that's kind of crappy. So. Um, there's a good background of curb cuts and kind of their origin and when they started to become popular uh, if you're into podcasts, and there's an article there at 99pi.org. Um, but they're also really useful for people who might not have mobility issues. Somebody like pushing a two-wheel cart with packages on it, or somebody pulling a, a wagon behind them, or like a skateboard or scooter or something. So they're really useful. I'm going to zoom in here. It's that thing. They're really useful for a wide variety of people, but they're also critical for accessibility, and they're kind of, they're everywhere. So, these, what I consider curb cuts in UI, I'd say, you know, meet these three criteria. It's ubiquitous, ubiquitous default, it's everywhere, handy for a wide variety of people, but critical for accessibility. So before I get into free software specifically, or elementary OS specifically, I want to look at some examples that you're probably familiar with across other platforms, um, such as like mobile. On-screen keyboards are a curb cut. These started as a desktop accessibility feature for people who might not have the motor control or strength to use a standard keyboard, and they, but they might have had a motor control to control a cursor on a screen. But now they're ubiquitous in touchscreens because of the form factor mostly. But they're actually, it's really useful now in like platforms like Mac OS, or not Mac OS because they don't have touchscreens, but Windows, uh, the iPad, uh, Chrome OS, Android. These platforms have on screen keyboards, which are really, really nice for their touchscreen form factors, but they're also really nice for accessibility reasons. So it's the ubiquitous default. Most platforms support it by default. It's just a feature of the OS. You don't have to go install an on-screen keyboard on Windows. It's just part of the OS. Um, it's handy for a variety of people, whether that's motor impairments or whether that's um, touch screens. And it's critical for people who couldn't otherwise use the device. Speech input is another one. This is a big one uh, we've seen with like smartphones and smart home devices and you know, hey Siri, hey Google, Alexa, what's the weather? I promised myself I wouldn't do that, but if your device goes out, I'm a little sorry. I guess Mycroft. Um, this is an accessibility feature on the desktop for dictation and controlling your software, but it's become ubiquitous. We have voice input everywhere, and we control random light bulbs and things with it, and we you know, ask the weather, and, and my mother-in-law, who 
has a smartphone, like when she texts a long text, she will start typing it and she'll just be like, I'm just gonna hit the button and talk to it because that's easier and simpler for me to understand. So it's, again, it's, uh, oh, and it's here, I don't know if you can see, it's just a default feature on keyboards, and this is on iOS and on Android. It's just, there's just a button to do speech input. It's just a feature. It's not a special accessibility feature you have to go toggle on. So again, ubiquitous default. It's just there, handy for a wide variety of people, whether they have certain impairments or just prefer a certain way of using a device. And it serves a critical need for people who might not have the fine motor control required for a small touchscreen. Closed captions is another really interesting one. This is less about a specific platform and more um, kind of widely culturally accepted phenomenon. Uh, in the 1970s, closed captions were, I guess, invented for television broadcasts. And in the US, at least, we mandated by law that they had to be on any broadcast material that was in the US. And the, very soon after closed captions came out, uh, the majority of users of closed captions were not the hearing impaired which is what the law was designed to, to help um, for accessibility. Uh, there was a survey that said, I think it was over 70% of people who were uh, using closed captions on a regular basis were not hearing impaired. The largest group of that was people who were learning a second language. So they might be uh, English as a second language learners and turn on the TV and they can kind of hear what's going on, but when they can read it, it's much easier to understand for them and helps them learn the language better, both visually and through uh, hearing. And it's also frequently used in public spaces for things like reducing noise pollution, or you just have a lot of TVs and want to have a lot of things going at once and let people choose what they're looking at. We see closed captions. Um, Netflix has like closed captions on, built in. It's just like a button push away. Uh, and we see platforms like YouTube now even like auto-generating captions for, again, it helps with accessibility, but if you're like on a train and can't really turn up your volume, but you're trying to gather some information that's in a video format that's really useful for you. Um, and we're even seeing crazy features now in OSS. This is a new feature in Android where anywhere on your whole device it will use crazy magic machine learning on device AI stuff and transcribe in real time what's going on on your phone or even what's around you. And it's like, again, accessibility is really cool, but like there's so many utilities for this um, outside of just accessibility. So by providing this really handy accessibility feature, it's also useful for a wide variety of people. So again, ubiquitous default. Closed captions are a standard feature. It's one click away on YouTube, one click away on Netflix. Uh, it's handy in a multitude of, variety of uh, environments. And it serves a critical need uh, for those who do have, who are hard of hearing. So I want to look at some examples in elementary OS specifically. We started an initiative we call um, Accessibility Features Are Just Features recently and you can track it on the GitHub tracker there. Um, one of the first major efforts was we moved a lot of our universal access settings or accessibility settings uh, out of this kind of tucked away corner that was hidden in the OS. It wasn't really hidden, it was just nobody went there. Uh, and we graduated them into proper standard tested features of the desktop. So we put them where you would expect them in the software with related controls that weren't just accessibility related. Um, it's kind of ironic we called it uh, universal access when we heard from users that not very many of them used it because they didn't think it was for them. They thought, oh, I'm not disabled. I don't have a handicap. And it turns out that these features are useful for a lot of people. Uh, and if we expect it to be usable in a non-broken way, we should be confident enough to expose it to all users through the regular settings. So here's an example, I don't know if, it, if you can see from there, but uh, we introduced this appearance settings for our desktop, which includes things like text scaling. This used to be just a, an accessibility feature that said, well, you know, if, you're, if you have poor eyesight, maybe you want to turn up the text size. There's no reason that this isn't useful for a wide variety of users as well. Um, we hear from a lot of users of certain hardware, resolutions and size combinations, that they want to bump up the text size a little bit. And so we just support it as a standard feature. Um, things like reducing animations and translucency are also helpful for a wide variety of people. So they're here as well. We also, in our keyboard settings, we have repeat delay and cursor blink speeds. These are kind of traditional accessibility settings, but they're keyboard settings, really. They're just they're related to keyboard inputs, so we put them with the keyboard settings. 
Um, same with mouse and touchpad controls. There's things like double click speed, long press secondary click. Um, that one's really useful for accessibility if you have trouble double clicking, you don't have that motor control. But it's also really helpful on touch screens where you press and hold to get a menu. Um, and we actually had users of touch screens asking if there was a, you know, a way we could implement this throughout the OS. And it's, it's already there, it's already part of the standard stack. Uh, but they were having a hard time finding it. So it's, it's just a standard feature. And mouse pointing settings as well, uh, revealing the pointer when you hit control. You know, if you have a hard time spotting the little mouse cursor, uh, that can help you find it. But it's also nice for like screencasts and presentations. If you have a mouse cursor on the screen uh, in front of a, an audience like this, um, controlling the pointer with the keypad again, a standard, uh, an accessibility feature that has been turned into a standard feature here. That's well supported. And sound settings. This one is. Um, interesting because I've actually needed this personally. We have uh, when there's an event alert, so something like you're backspacing in, a, in an empty text field, it goes like dum dum dum. Um, we there's a setting. There was a setting in accessibility to, to turn that into a screen flash, and then there was a setting in the sound settings to turn that sound on or off. We combined these settings into one place because they made sense. They're grouped together, um, and that way you can you know do sound or flash or neither or both. And this addresses accessibility needs, like if you can't hear, then a sound is not helpful to you. But it's also useful in like live audio production, uh, which I've done. And you might not want your machine making any extra noises besides uh, what you're playing through, through the speakers. And so you turn it into a screen flash instead. Another way we've done this in elementary OS is uh, better system, better contrast across the entire system through the system style sheet. So the web content accessibility guidelines, or abbreviated WCAG, or however you want to pronounce that, um, they have this rating system of A, AA, or AAA contrast, and it deals with how, how contrasty the foreground text is against the background. In elementary OS, we strive for AA or better contrast. Um, if we, well, oftentimes we meet the AAA contrast guidelines, and we're striving to meet it in more situations. And this is, according to those guidelines, if you have AAA contrast and somebody still can't read your uh, text properly, they're already almost certainly using uh, further accessibility features like magnification or screen readers. So by making the entire style sheet uh, AA or AAA contrast compliant, you're really helping a lot of users who would otherwise switch into a, like a separate high contrast mode. So this has reduced the need for a, a completely separate experience for these users. Um, it's also just nice when you're on a projector like this and your foreground text and background text, you know, the projector doesn't have the best contrast in the world, so by having better contrast through the whole system, it's easier to read for everybody. Another uh, initiative we've done with this is introducing color schemes into some of our core apps, like the terminal and code editor. And they're accessible by default color scheme choices. Instead of, you know, saying here's a million different colors, you choose what color works for you, um, which you can still do under the hood if you know how it all works. We offer three like bespoke, pre-designed, accessible by default color schemes, a dark, a light, and a high contrast light. And these are great, uh, I've heard from people who use the high contrast light theme for things like they're programming outside and the sunlight is hitting their screen and like they have the brightness all the way up and they can't see their screen. But with this high contrast mode, they're getting the maximum brightness they can and it's just a standard feature that anybody can use. You know, in that situation, you might not think, I, uh, I need an accessibility feature, I'm gonna go find it in the settings, turn on a system-wide accessibility setting. You just are trying to code or something. And so it's really handy to have this quick access as a standard feature. And for uh, dark and light style, this, is, this helps people with, you know, if they have migraines or are working in a dark uh, environment, this kind of echoes some of the talks we've had about uh, a system-wide dark preference. Uh, it's just more accessible and it's just a standard feature that's well supported. So these are all really cool features, um, but I think what's really important, the, the big takeaway is they're not really features, it's, it's more about the mindset that you have when designing your software. Um, I hope that as designers and developers of especially open source software, we can adopt this mindset of, of curb cuts in making our software accessible to people by default and uh, more useful to more people. And again, better design. Oh, wait, if you uh, if you implement curb cuts throughout your software, I believe you'll have better design, 
uh, it'll be more useful to more people and it'll be better tested for those accessibility features since they're not just uh, a separate feature. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Cool. Oh, it's pretty short. I appreciate what you did Thank because um, in my experience the accessibility features are the first one to fall victim to other cuts in particular the budget cuts and mm -hmm. um, yeah my actual question then is those those color schemes any consideration towards the color blind users like any color schemes specific like so that they can distinguish like the I don't know, the, the, the contrast, like the contrast of colors with focus on those who can't distinguish the colors. Yeah, so this is another kind of accessible by default thing we're doing uh, throughout the design of elementary OS. Um, we try not to ever rely only on color for meaning. So we always try to have a symbol or um, shades, not just a, a strict colors. Um, there's, I don't, I guess there's not a separate, separate color blind accessibility mode that I'm aware of. But again, by using symbols and, and common metaphors, um, you're not relying on color. So, and this also helps for like we've seen on other platforms they have like grayscale modes for like reducing the amount of distraction that you get. Um, and I found like on my phone that that's really important to be. If it's only using color to distinguish things, then even for me, who's not colorblind, when I'm using certain modes or in certain environments with dim lighting or whatever, um, it's more accessible to me as well. Thank you. Good question. Um, so I, I really like the idea of uh, accessibility by uh, default. And, and how could we make that as an experience just like across app ecosystem? As a, I mean, do you have... Uh, do you, have you thought about that idea as across, uh, you know, just all, all of our desktop projects? It seems like a, a great distinguishable feature, um, especially in the small segment that's sometimes often forgotten when you write build and write apps, right? So, I think a big part of that is uh, it's up to the platforms. Um, platforms should have accessible style sheets by default. So Adweta and uh, the elementary style sheet and what KDE uses uh, by default should be accessible and high contrast, um, but also human, interfa human interface guidelines for those platforms uh, have a role to play there as well, of saying, hey, accessibility is important. Here's how you can make sure you have high contrast. Make sure you use symbols in these contexts, not just color. Um, and establishing those conventions in first party apps as well. So I think all GNOME apps and all elementary apps should strive to have uh, very, very good accessibility by default without have, resorting to separate modes. And that's not to say separate modes are unimportant, and you should also test everything in separate modes as well, but I, I think when that happens, um, or those are the most likely instances where you have broken apps is when you're using it in a theme you've never tested against, for example. Um, so yeah, I think setting, setting the standards by the platforms themselves is, is probably the most effective way. Uh, sorry. Go All right, it. so uh, I'm curious, does night mode really interfere with, since uh, it changes the temperature of the screen, does, does that? Yeah, so that, um, so you're saying like a night shift or night mode where it's, or night light, I guess, where it's shifting red over the day. Um, I don't think it really interferes. I think that's yet another example of it could be considered accessibility. It's trying to make your device easier for you to use or your, the device easier for certain people to use in certain circumstances. Um, I think, again, that goes back to color, colorblind testing and using symbols. If, if you assume your screen is going to look a certain way and it's actually way more red, um, certain colors can get lost. But that's also true of just hardware in general. Like Certain displays are a lot lower quality. Again, like projectors are just older desktop displays or whatever. So I think these are pretty universal principles for design.
Yeah, I also like the idea to have accessibility by default. I'm a journalist and I'm actually writing about an article about accessibility um, on uh, Linux. And uh, I uh, gathered some feedback. And um, what we should keep in mind is that, there are, that accessibility is not accessibility. So different um, people have different needs. For example, um, I asked um, a guy who had problems with seeing and he said, High contrast is for him a problem. The windows are jumping for him, and so he put it, make it a total different, and make it low contrast, which is more accessible to, to him. So, but of course, to have it by default and for the most people, and then to have it to set up the possibility to set it up for special needs is, is a good thing. And I also make um, some people uh, from. Uh, uh, I, I showed them just Ubuntu and they didn't know uh, Linux before and they tested I like this um, okay some accessibility features I need to set up in the accessibility settings some others I must back jump back to the mouse settings and so on this was also confusing so um, and when we think about for example the on-screen uh, keyboard um, I, maybe I'm not correct, but I thought it come more from not from accessibility, more from um, yeah, like have touch screen devices, and we want to have the so it's a on screen keyboard in GNOME, is it, isn't it? Was it just from this approach to have a GNOME tablet or something, or, or I'm wrong? Yeah, so in um, I guess I go in order there. There was talking about low contrast and differing needs for different people. Um, for that, we've talked about, by having a high contrast style by default, you're, it's actually a lot easier to do things like a low contrast shader in a window manager. Um, it's a lot harder to get good quality results in like increasing the contrast in a shader without really blowing stuff out. Um, but it's a lot easier to, to reduce the contrast for certain users. So I think by having a, a more accessible default for a lot of people, you can also do more interesting things in software that makes it more useful for other people as well. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about that at Quadic last year, or earlier this year. Um, as far as the separation of settings, you know, having separate accessibility settings versus integrated into the settings, that's a conversation we had a lot. Um, I haven't heard, I guess, any like expert opinions on it. I'd be curious to hear that. I think the goal, unless I hear a, strong, a compelling case otherwise, the goal would be to um, have all of these settings in their more natural places throughout the system. Um, so they're more, more widely used and just easier to find when you're looking for them. I think having a separate accessibility section may be a relic of a time when we just kind of shoved everything in the corner and didn't ever test it. Um, but I'm not sure. If I hear otherwise, I think there's interesting things we could do. Um, something we do in elementary OS is we actually have a system-wide search. So if you're searching for certain types of settings, it's really easy to expose where they are in the, in the settings app itself. So I think there's probably more interesting things we can do around that. And the third thing was keyboard. keyboard, yeah. So I'm not, I am fairly certain in GNOME Shell it was designed for touch, uh, but I think the feature as far as desktop goes, like it, it predates touch screens on computers, like having an on-screen keyboard, that feature, um, because there's certain users who maybe can't use their hands but are using the, the pointer stick on their head and motion tracking, um, and that's a way they can type without using, using their hands or fingers. Um, so that, that sort of a feature originally was an accessibility feature, and then now has become a widespread like hardware compatibility feature or form factor feature, uh, but it also still is really useful for accessibility. But for example, the, the on-screen uh, on keyboard in GNOME don't have... For example, the on-screen keyboard on GNOME, um, it don't has tap or some keys you you need, for example, if you... so, And the problem of... Uh, the, um, the problem of thinking like accessibility features are features for everybody, I, I like the idea, but what we keep in mind of, we shouldn't then forget the accessibility needs. Yeah. So right. if I say, okay, so I just want a fancy on-screen keyboard, uh, just nice, yeah, so, um, and if I want to, I, I never use a terminal with on-screen keyboard, but some people need it to, so we shouldn't um, forget the testing on accessibility. Yeah, yeah, I think Kind of goes back to there's varying needs for varying people. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not super familiar with the GNOME Shell keyboard specifically and what features it has. Um, we don't we don't use GNOME Shell in elementary OS, so um, yeah, I think it is important to remember that.
Any more questions? Thank you.